Uh, thanks and good afternoon. I now see, given the layout of the room, that you won't be able to read my slides, so that's fine. And I'll just I'll just speak to them. Um, and thank you very much for for having me today. Um, Mark uh, spoke earlier about sort of the general Canadian market and where it's at, and so I'd like to go another step from that and talk a bit about the way in which the market delivers a PPP in Canada uh, after 10 years of experience. Um, so I can't see it. Um, So generally in Canada, we have these organizations. Uh, there's 10 provinces in Canada and six have PPP programs. And they all have different organizations. I'm sure it's the same in Australia that uh, we all have to do things differently in each of our little parts of Canada. And all these organizations, uh, they have a lot in common despite their differences. Um, Partnerships BC, Infrastructure Ontario, SASC Build, which is just uh, up and running, Saskatchewan project. Uh, company, they're all owned by the government um, and they all uh, are commercially oriented in that they are outside of government and they're set up as Crown Corporations. Alberta Infrastructure, Infrastructure Quebec is also a Crown Corporation, but um, uh, Alberta Infrastructure and uh, Partnerships New Brunswick are, are part of government. Um, our organization, for example, we do DBFM, Design, Build, Finance, Maintain, PPP. We also do Design, Build. We also do major projects um, that aren't PPP. I learned a long time ago that the politicians actually don't care about public-private partnerships. They care about doing big projects and having them on time and on budget. So for example, uh, BC Hydro, a crown-owned utility in British Columbia, they wanted to implement 1.8 million smart meters in every house in British Columbia for a total cost of about a billion dollars. That was a procurement that had a lot of hair on it, uh, a lot of political risk and a lot of financial exposure and we took that project on and did it even though it had nothing to do with public-private partnerships and it's just because uh, we could do something for our, our politicians um, while we did it. And in Canada we have uh, uh, the federal government has PPP Canada which is also a funding agency and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So you can see here the, the extent of uh, involvement, you can't see here, sorry. There's a whole bunch of provinces and there's a whole bunch of projects, but it's just meant to show you uh, the extent of the sort of horizontal nature of the market in Canada. And, and some parts of Canada have, have not done any PPP and have no interest in going there whatsoever. So from the point of view of why do we do public-private partnerships after 10 years, why do we do them? Like, what is the bottom line on why we continue to do them in Canada? The first, the first ones are sort of the, how the politicians view it. And I, I'm amazed, like after my 10 years of involvement, how much the political people appreciate the planning discipline that goes into a PPP. We do business plans now that are 150 pages long. 10 years ago, they were three pages long. You know, we have so much more uh, work going into the planning process. Uh, cost estimates, line by line risk assessment, we learn so much about the project from doing the planning that helps us actually do the project. What risk should we transfer? What risk should we keep? We do it line by line. This costs money and government is now used to spending a few million dollars at the beginning of a billion dollar capital project. They're used to it now and they actually really appreciate the rigor of this work. I that. As a private sector guy, that surprised me. Um, and then, of course, the cost-effective risk transfer and the integration between design, build, finance, and maintain, the e efficiencies of the private sector, um, these are all now appreciated. Bottom line to most politicians in Canada is these projects are on time and on budget. And in fact, they tend to be earlier than budget because with private finance, the construction people have an extraordinary incentive to get done early because they don't get they don't get paid until they're finished and they've got outstanding capital. So we find that most of the projects are ahead of schedule and typically on or under budget. The bottom one here about effective long-term asset management, that's more for the government officials, I think, than it is for the politicians because it means if you have a, a project with a 30-year concession, that asset will be looked after for 30 years and even if the politicians want to focus on capital projects and not maintenance, 
can't do it. So the, the assets end up being managed better, which ultimately lowers costs in the long run, a hidden benefit. So I know you can't see this, but this is uh, our value for money calculation. Everybody in, in Canada produces a, uh, a project report after each project is finished and it presents why it was done as a PPP and what some of the benefits might have been, including a value for money estimate, which is the difference between the actual bid and the, um, and the public sector comparator. So right across the country, we generate, we get value for money on every project. Interesting, every province has a different way of calculating value for money, so it varies, but it's always positive. Um, there hasn't been one yet um, that it's had to publish with a negative number. Some come pretty close. So I thought to, to explain the way um, the delivery model works in Canada, I just go through what I consider to be the success factors for a PPP program and then see how we do against those success factors. Why is that doing? Um, the first, of course, is political support. We all know that and we've all got that. Uh, the second is uh, enabling policy or legislation and, and as, as Mark mentioned earlier in Canada we have a capital standard. We have in British Columbia we have a 300 page capital asset management framework policy to guide the government bureaucracy in, the, in doing major capital projects. I've never read it. What we have is a capital standard which means if the project is in our case more than 50 million dollars you have to include a PPP in your business case. That is the hammer that m motivates the government officials to do the proper business cases. And now, as Mark mentioned, right across Canada, almost every jurisdiction has a uh, capital standard. Um, and a focused planning and procurement agency, uh, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, in every place in Canada, the procurement agency, whether it's a standalone or whether it's part of government, is cross-sectoral. Uh, as we look at the United States market evolving, where most of their PPP activity is in the transportation sector and states are having a difficult time integrating their Department of Transportation with other areas of government. And, and in Canada, that seems not to have been a problem. They're, these agencies do a health care project, they do a transportation project, and for small regions of the country, like every province is not very big, um, that's what creates the expertise is moving the expertise from one sector to another. And that's the memory that you get, and that's what makes an informed client, which is what the private sector wants. So it's, to me, the cross-sector aspect of it is, is fundamental. As I say, commercially focused, um, we get paid, we charge by the hour. Uh, in Ontario, they charge by the project. Um, in Quebec, they charge by the project. And so everybody has a revenue base, but basically it's you earn by doing in some way and that again motivates you it also um, you know makes you manage your company commercially uh, we don't try and make a profit we try and break even but you know we the board no I am the board the board now measures uh, performance based on how we do against our financial targets um, having a memory is critical as I've mentioned and you know we spend a lot of time developing guidance and templates and and that ultimately helps lower costs over time as you go along, um, lowering procurement costs for both sides. And also, the bidders start to understand, well, if it's British Columbia, uh, their position on force majeure is this. And it doesn't matter whether it's a health care project or, a, or an energy project, that's our position on force majeure. They don't have to educate us on every project. So the more that we can have that, and I think that politically the government wants that, I don't think they want to be inconsistent from sector to sector, so it's a mechanism to get that standardization uh, across the government, which is a good thing. Uh, formal project governance is another. We have a project board for every project. And I just wanted to make one small point here. I wish I would stop doing that. Um, is that our role um, in the project is there's a, there's a formal board, there's a fairness advisor, and then there's all your technical people on the project team. And one of the boxes is the procurement manager and that is us. And in Ontario, that is Infrastructure Ontario. In Quebec, that is Infrastructure Quebec. They are actually have a couple of people on the project team doing the procurement and hiring the business advisors and the financial advisors. And so from the, from the bidder's point of view, they see the same people on every project. They see Partnerships BC. They see the same position. And those people learn and, and have a memory 
And so for a small economy like British Columbia, where we're doing maybe three, four, five, six projects at a time, for four million people, you can have a group of 35 or 40 or 20 professionals who can go across all the different sectors and then live to do another deal uh, in another sector with that memory. Uh, continuous program, heard a lot about that this morning. It's, it's critical to allow the bidders to amortize their activities over a number of projects. Um, a fair and robust competitive selection process. Emphasis here is on collaboration and so that you work with the bidders so that by the time they actually present their bids, they all bid to the same concession agreement and there's no comments in the margins. It's done. And that way there's no negotiation, which means the period that they have to hold their financial prices firm for you is narrowed down because there's no negotiating process. So bidders really appreciate that and it saves a lot of money if they only have to hold their, their financial spreads for, for 60 days instead of uh, 120. It's a, it's a lot better. Um, a discipline process and an evaluation process that motivates bidders. We've learned a lot about evaluation in a decade. Um, here's an example. Actually, uh, I could use this, a slide that Plenary has on this, but I, I'll, I won't. Um, that the cost of a hospital, uh, the capital project is probably 10% of the cost of a hospital over 30 years. 90% of the cost is clinical care. So if we evaluate bidders based on the building that they're going to design, build, finance, and maintain, what about the 90% of the cost of the project that is affected by the building? So we've designed ways in which when they bid, they bid a price and we, we will ultimately take the lowest price. But we also have some scored elements. So if they do certain things that improve patient outcomes or lower costs over time to operate the hospital clinically, we'll give them a credit against their price. And our politicians, they appreciate that because to them, we're showing the overall lower cost for 30 years, not just the lower cost for the building. That's just an example, but there's a lot you can do now in terms of these scored elements in different projects. We do it on hydro projects, uh, vertical infrastructure projects, scored elements that show that you're getting something more than just the cost of the building as a benefit. And, and another way of saying that is you provide a roadmap to victory so bidders know they can calculate, they can self-evaluate. They can look at the, at, the, at, the, at the RFP response and they can determine exactly how many points they're going to get and so they can evaluate how they're doing um, and it's not subjective really in any way. So this is just an example of a, uh, <laughs> of a rigorous PPP process. All I need to say here is that it's, it's a question of discipline. Our performance measure at Partnerships BC is uh, 18 months. 18 months from completion of business case to shovels in the ground. And um, I don't think we've had one that's gone over that. And it's a, it's a performance measure for the, for the management team. And it's absolutely critical to the bidders that they know that it's going to be 18 months because the longer you do things, the more you'll spend. It's in just a, it's a truth. Um, I know in all these thrashing arounds with the slides, I missed a point. And that is, um, I wanted to make a comment about optimized financing, because one of the big developments that we've had in Canada since, um, you call it the global financial crisis, since the GFC, uh, and during the GFC, by the way, we did two projects where we had no debt at all. We called them wide equity, and we just said the debt here is way too expensive, and uh, we're not going to use any, but we, and we did risk transfer just with, by having 20% of equity on the, in the project rather than the usual 10. But then when the market stabilized again and the spreads came down and interest rate levels came down, we had learned something through the GFC, and that is you should economize on that which is expensive, i.e. capital. So now we will blend our own government contributions, um, grants, or um, we have hospital authorities that, that raise money, and perhaps donations from the grants from the federal government. We blend that with private capital and so we ensure that we get all the risk transfer um, with the minimum amount of private capital and that's how you can really expand your value for money. I, I think at least in Canada and if there's bankers here please correct me but I think there's a flaw in the market and the flaw is that if you have a 200 million dollar project and you have 200 million dollars of private capital 
with 90-10 leverage, you've got 180 million of debt, and then you reduce it to maybe 100 million of private capital for a 200 million dollar project, 90 million dollars of debt, the spread won't change. The credit rating won't change, and the spread won't change. And so you can actually get all the risk transfer on your 90 million and not have to pay for private capital for 180. And I know there's a point where that stops working uh, because I know there's one project that I won't mention in detail where the private capital is only 20% of the project cost and the credit rating went down a notch and the spread went up a bit. But still, um, what, that, what that is doing from the owner's perspective is it's saving ourselves a lot of money and taking advantage of our high credit ratings at the provincial level, but it's demotivating on the investment side because the you know $100 million, $10 million or $5 million of equity is not going to attract the big pension funds to pick up their pencils and, and take a look at it. So it's changing the Canadian market uh, by this optimization process and we have to be vigilant that, that we don't overdo it um, because it works for us even though it may not work as well for the private sector. So that's a really big change that has taken place in Canada over the last, you know, five, five, six years. This final slide, <laughs> wherever it is, the final slide. Uh, the final slide shows the, the width of the program in British Columbia. So we're a little old four million person province and um, we've done 35 projects in, yeah, take it away from me. I've done 35 projects in, in 10 years and we started in health and transportation and we, we've, we've now done vertical infrastructure, university buildings, uh, social, social housing, waste, wastewater, water. Uh, we're just closing tomorrow, well, tomorrow, Vancouver day. Um, we're closing the um, first power project, hydroelectric power project, billion dollars. Um, it's a, 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 an asset of BC Hydro. And we just got extraordinary innovation in our bids. I mean, it's, it's just been amazing. These are such engineering intensive type projects that the risks the, are huge and the scope for innovation is so large that um, we, we got a solution which the engineers at BC Hydro, I mean, it was just not part of their thinking, the solution that, that the, the three bidders came up with and the one that won the contest. So uh, it, that's been a real, um, a real win. Long-term care facilities, Correctional facilities, sports centers, and some bio some bioenergy projects that we're now working on. So, by making the project, uh, making the, the the functions as wide as possible, having the most projects, you can increase your deal flow, increase interest in your market, and make the most of being in a small market. So I'll stop there. Thank you.